Hi, my name is Nathan Taggart. I'm a pediatric cardiologist at Mayo Clinic. Um, I practice in the cardiac cath lab and read echocardiograms, and I'm excited to talk to you a little bit today about coarctation of the aorta. The uh, purpose of this talk is to recognize the common clinical presentations of coarctation at different ages, to identify echocardiographic features that suggest coarctation of the aorta, and then to summarize briefly some surgical and transcatheter treatment options for that lesion. This is the only pathologic slide I'm going to show you because I'm not a pathologist and I try to avoid creating pathology, but uh, the, the typical coarctation that we often talk about is a juxtaductal, meaning opposite the ductus arteriosus, juxtaductal coarct uh, that shows up with a posterior shelf as, as annotated there. Um, the, uh, the presence of the ductus sometimes can help us recognize whether it's juxtaductal or not. Uh, in some cases, there's no ductus, but there is a ligamentum, such as in this CT angiogram of about a 40-year-old adult with a ligamentum where the ductus was opposite that posterior shelf. This is kind of a 3D reconstruction of that same CT angiogram. Uh, you'll also notice a couple of things as you look at this. Um, a lot of calcification in the region, just proximal and a little bit beyond the, um, the narrowing, and then, and then calcification in the coronary arteries. And, I won't go into a whole lot of details about the, uh, the things we need to worry about in uh, patients who have had coarctation over their life, but, uh, but early coronary artery disease and, and stiffening and calcification of the aorta are certainly a couple of those things that we worry about. The epidemiology of coarctation is uh, that it, it affects about 40 to 50 live births out of 100,000. Uh, that uh, means that it's involved in about 8 to 10 percent of congenital heart disease or, or defects, sometimes associated with more complex lesions, as we'll talk about in, the, in a little bit. Uh, men or boys are, are affected more frequently than, than women are. And its association with bicuspid aortic valve is, is well understood. Um, in general, something around 75% of patients who have coarctation will have a bicuspid aortic valve. And, um, now shown in this Venn diagram here, the opposite, of course, is not true. So that, that means that bicuspid valve is a lot more common than coarctation. So just because you see a bicuspid valve, does not portend a, a significantly uh, increased risk of coarctation, but certainly those who have coarctation are much more likely to have bicuspid valve. The uh, presentation of coarctation really uh, depends upon um, the other things going on. So when, when it shows up in neonates, uh, it typically means that it's a more severe lesion. And with that, there will often will be a ductus, uh, often of necessity that there's a ductus so to maintain uh, distal, lower half of the body perfusion. Um, more severe coarctation also is associated with arch hypoplasia. And then other lesions uh, that will present with murmur, with other symptoms in the neonate, may push up that, that, uh, that timeline of presentation for coarctation in a neonate. Lesions such as malalignment VSD, specifically posterior malalignment VSD, and other LV outflow gradient or outflow uh, obstructive lesions, subaortic stenosis. Um, aortic stenosis or atresia for other reasons, uh, and it can be associated with more complex uh, abnormalities such as transposition or complete AV canal. Um, when you have a constellation of findings of uh, left heart obstructive lesions, that's, uh, that's what we call Schoen's complex, as we'll talk about on the next slide. Um, <clears throat> in, uh, when you're talking about coarctation in an older child or an adult showing up at that age, it typically is isolated just because they, they have lived long enough to kind of not show a murmur or other things from some of these other lesions that would have presented earlier in life. So they typically show up a little bit later, uh, often with an isolated finding with the exception of uh, a bicuspid aortic valve. So a couple of syndromes that are associated with coarctation that we know about, Turner syndrome, which is a single X sex chromosome, um, phenotypically female but infertile with either streak ovaries or absence of ovaries. Uh, it's a syndrome, it's an aortopathy syndrome, so there are other implications to that that I can't get into detail in this, uh, this shorter lecture, but about 15% um, of those with Turner syndrome will have coarctation of the aorta, and the actual recommendations from the, from the American College of Cardiology are that all females who have coarctation, particularly diagnosed early in life, should have screening for, for Turner syndrome due to this association. Schoen's complex, uh, not technically a syndrome, but still a similar sort of thing. It's, it's the, a complex of multiple findings, cardiac and vascular abnormalities. 
typically we refer to this as multi-level left heart obstruction. Uh, the classic shown complex is one of supervalvar mitral ring with an abnormal parachute mitral valve, subaortic stenosis or a subaortic membrane, and a coarctation. So let's talk a little bit about what it looks like in the child and, and the adult at first presentation. So the most common co presenting complaints in the adult would be hypertension that's difficult to treat or just chronic for no good explanation. That may be a presentation in a child, but more often in, in children, you'll hear a murmur. And that's probably because of the smaller chest, the easier it is to, to appreciate a murmur. That murmur is often heard best between the scapulae um, because it's uh, the descending aorta posteriorly. Other symptoms may include cold feet or claudication, pain or cramping in the, in the legs and the calves, uh, particularly with exertion. A lot of times though, these patients don't have symptoms and it may be difficult to elicit any sort of symptom. On exam, as I mentioned, an, a, a typical murmur, systolic ejection type murmur that may be heard loudest over the back. You may have a click from a bicuspid aortic valve, and really the hallmark physical finding in uh, patients with a significant coarctation is a discrepancy or a gradient between the upper extremity and lower extremity systolic blood pressure as measured by non-invasive uh, cuff pressures. Uh, along with that, uh, you, you would see, could see dis diminished lower extremity pulses. Uh, you may appreciate a brachial femoral pulse delay um, and so feeling the brachial artery and the femoral artery simultaneously or the radial artery, femoral artery simultaneously, you'll notice a delay where you feel it in your left hand at the, uh, the brachial or the radial slightly before you feel it in the femoral artery, suggesting it's taking a little bit longer for that pulse wave to propagate down, uh, down the aorta due to the coarctation. This is kind of a classic chest x-ray for um, coarctation, which of course means that you don't see it this often, uh, but you do see it in a textbook. And if you look closely at this, you see a couple of things. You see uh, something that my kids scribbled that they would say is a three. Uh, that's called the three sign, uh, this sort of lateral, left lateral indentation that goes along with uh, that, uh, that shelf on the coarctation or, or narrowing in that distal a aortic arch, um, the three sign. And then if you zoom in a little bit closer over here, you look at the undersurface of the ribs, you see a little bit of irregularity uh, as opposed to a smooth contour. We call that rib notching from the engorged uh, intercostal arteries uh, due to uh, the coarctation. So collateral flow through those intercostal arteries enlarges them and they, uh, that erodes a little bit on the undersurface of the ribs and that's rib notching. On echo, of course, this is how we diagnose it almost exclusively. Um, bicuspid aortic valve may or may not be present as we talked about. This is a really pretty bicuspid aortic valve. Um, and then uh, going a little bit out of order how we would normally do it, but looking at the abdominal Doppler wave signal. Now here at Mayo Clinic, we start most of our studies from a subcostal approach. So this may be in all likelihood the first uh, sign echocardiographically that you have a significant coarctation. And what you see is continuous forward flow in the descending aorta. Now uh, this is what it looks like with spectral Doppler. So the, the, the flow velocity uh, or the flow never quite reaches back down to the baseline. You have the sawtooth jagged pattern. Compare that to a normal abdominal aorta Doppler signal as shown here. Brisk early systolic upstroke, a nice brisk downstroke as well in, in systole. This, you have this early diastolic reversal of flow, okay, as the coronaries fill. And then you have this, uh, this rebound due to the elasticity of the blood vessel, late diastolic forward flow. This is a, a typical normal aor abdominal aorta Doppler signal. By comparison in another patient now, this is clearly abnormal. And what we see is we see a slow upstroke, we see a gradual slow downstroke, and then this continuous forward flow with the absence of diastolic reversals. So this, unless, until proven otherwise, you have to consider this to be coarctation of the aorta. This is what our patient looks like, clearly abnormal, okay? This is a little bit of a uh, faster paper speed, as it were, so you don't quite see the slow upstroke, but there is that lack of uh, diastolic reversal that is a hallmark uh, for coarctation of the aorta. Now we'll jump ahead and go to a supersternal sagittal view to look at the aortic arch and we see a pretty good size aortic arch and as often is the case we get a lot of shadowing down here as we're getting close to the bron left bronchus and we, it's hard to tease things out but if you look a little closely here where this star is you'll see what looks like a posterior shelf. Now this you want to be careful not to confuse this with some of those other structures or, or just to shadowing and so you, you uh, interrogate of course with color Doppler. And a quick glance, if you're in a hurry, you could look at this and say, well, I don't see a whole lot of aliasing where I'd want to see a coarctation. Maybe this is normal, but a couple of things jump out. 
you look in the far field, you see continuous blue flow. Okay, so remember the continuous forward flow in the abdominal aorta. You can have that same sort of phenomenon in the uh, descending thoracic aorta as well. And then in the region of the isthmus here, there's just not a whole lot there. It's quite narrow. And when you get your Doppler uh, interrogation across that spot right there, what you see is a high velocity continuous flow, kind of the mirror image of what we saw in the abdominal aorta signal there. Peak velocity here about four meters per second. This is clearly abnormal. Sawtooth pattern, coarctation of the aorta. So a little bit about Doppler echo and coarctation. We use both CW and PW. Uh, in general, we like to calculate a mean gradient if it's a pulsatile signal. So you may have a significant coarctation that comes at or comes to or near the baseline again. So if you have that and your V1, so your proximal velocity is low, a mean gradient is the best way to, to sort of uh, describe the, the severity of the coarctation hemodynamically. Um, in the absence of that, the corrected max instantaneous gradient can be used. So in the absence of those sort of findings, so if you have a continuous flow and it's hard to know, well, where do I stop tracing? Tough to know. You can use a corrected max, and that's a little bit more complicated, but this is the equation that looks like you. It's a, it's a modified Bernoulli, but you're squaring the V1, you're subtracting it from the square of V2, and then you're multiplying that by 4. Okay, and we'll go through an example of that shortly. Um, Another option would be to estimate kind of where the end of this curve is. It's kind of typically where you see a change in the slope, and it tends to follow or, or make a parabolic uh, shape there. Okay, that's often how I will measure a mean gradient, even in the presence of this continuous uh, flow through the coarctation. Okay, there's your V1, because you've got two, a double density signal there, your V1 there your V2 there that you can, uh, you can find with CW. So V1 could be PW or CW with a double density signal. V2 has to be continuous wave. Now keep in mind that you can have an anatomically severe coarctation, a, a narrowing of that, of that aorta, but you may calculate a gradient that is disproportionately low relative to that narrowing. And the question is, how could that be? How could it be that we don't, we're not calculating a, a high gradient in the setting of a severe coarctation? And that could be because of low cardiac output, meaning low stroke volume. So you just have less blood going across the narrowing, your gradient is going to be lower. Uh, you could have a PDA or some other sort of pop-off, as it were, that allows blood to either bypass the narrowing or go through other channels or another supply to the descending aorta such that all of the blood going to the descending aorta doesn't have to cross that, um, that coarctation. That could be a PDA, collateral arteries. Um, other issue would be the length of obstruction. And in that situation, the modified Bernoulli equation is less reliable to uh, predict a, a pressure gradient if it's a complex, tortuous, or long uh, area of, of stenosis. Going back to our patient that we started with, uh, this is what the Doppler signal looked like. As we recall, there are two signals there. So this one can be V1 with a velocity of about 1.4 meters per second. This one is V2 with a velocity of around 4 meters per second. If you plug that into the equation we presented earlier, you get a corrected max instantaneous gradient of about 56 millimeters of mercury. Now, as I said, another option would be to trace here a mean gradient and kind of follow it down and there. And that would be sort of that par parabola, parabolic uh, tracing there with a velocity of 4. Max instantaneous gradient, non-corrected, is going to be 64, right? In general, the, uh, a parabolic tracing of that will be about half uh, the max instantaneous gradient. So a mean gradient uh, would be, could be around 35 to 40 millimeters of mercury. You'll notice there's a big difference between the mean and the corrected max. And that's always tough to know, well, what is true? And then really what's true is that it's a significant coarctation that needs to be fixed. We often will report both of those values in our echo reports. And it's rare that we get, to, unless we're going to stent the coarctation, it's rare that we get a, um, an invasive pressure a gradient to correlate with whatever the echo finding is. The take home point, though, is severe coarctation needs something done about it. Now let's jump over to the neonate and how coarctation shows up in that population. Um, now this does require us to remember a little bit about the fetal circulation. So in normal fetal circulation, you send a lot of blood across the ductus arteriosus, right? Because we're not pumping a whole lot of blood to the lungs. Even more so um, in the setting of coarctation of the aorta, where you have very little contribution to descending aorta flow, 
from the LV because of the coarctation, limiting it to pass down to the descending aorta. And so the right ventricle really becomes dominant. It not only supplies the normal blood it would have pumped across the ductus, but additional blood that, 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 um, that supplies the descending aorta. Um, and so the right ventricle becomes enlarged. And so a, cl a classic presentation is a seven-day-old where the um, ductus arteriosus is closed and they show up with congestive heart failure and um, a large right ventricle potentially with poor function. Uh, this is a critical coarctation, okay? And when, when we say critical, what we mean is that in order to maintain, uh, or in order to avoid heart failure, uh, you need to have the ductus open, so it's ductal dependent, okay? And in the absence of a ductus, renal failure, acidosis, circulatory shock can, can occur. On exam, this again depends upon the severity of the coarct, the presence of the ductus, and other things, but you may show up with tachypnea and congestion on exam, a prominent right ventricular impulse, a murmur if, you can, if the ductus is small or closed, uh, a murmur from the coarctation. If the ductus is small or closed, you may have diminished lower extremity pulses. You might have heart, right heart failure with hepatomegaly. And in the presence of a ductus, you should expect to have an upper, upper to lower extremity saturation differential of some amount. And that will depend, again, upon the, uh, the size of the ductus and the, the, uh, the narrowing of the coarctation. So it's all kind of a, a, um, a spectrum there. This is a chest x-ray of a neonate with coarctation. It's not very helpful because for a few things, um, uh, the aorta is here. There might be some congestion in the lung fields, big thymus that kind of obscures the mediastinal shadow. It's hard to really make much out of that. There might be some prominence to the right atrium here suggesting right heart enlargement or uh, right heart failure. Now, uh, the echo then is the way that we diagnose it, of course, in, in infants. So from a subcostal sagittal view, looking at the right ventricle here, pulmonary artery coming off there, you see a large right ventricle. You see some flattening of the ventricular septum right there. LV, at least in that view, doesn't look like it's squeezing very well. From a four-chamber view, still have a thick, dilated right ventricle. LV a bit smaller. Seems to be squeezing OK right now. But this, the hallmark or the, or the most noticeable finding in these images is the right ventricular enlargement and hypertrophy. So going now to the short axis here, you'll notice, if you can, if you believe me, bicuspid aortic valve, again, a bit of right ventricular enlargement, um, maybe a PFO there. And then we look at the abdominal aortic Doppler signal. So remember what I said in children and adults, okay? This is very important. You look at the abdominal aortic Doppler signal here. This is without color. Looks like it's kind of pulsatile. You interrogate that with pulse wave Doppler, and you see, well, this looks kind of normal. Brisk, brisk, reversal, and then return to above baseline there. Huh, this doesn't make sense because we think there's a significant coarctation based on the other things we're looking at, but this looks pretty normal. So let's think about that and why that might be. So you have normal abdominal aorta pulsatility and a normal Doppler profile, but of course this is a talk about coarctation, so something must explain why this is normal, okay? So let's think about that. Now, we go to the parasternal short axis view again, a little bit higher up where we can see the bifurcation of the branch pulmonary arteries, right pulmonary artery, left pulmonary artery, large PDA with a almost entirely right to left shunt. Okay, now we're starting to put things together here. Let's think about that now. And then you go uh, to a sagittal view and you're looking at a high parasternal ductal arch view. And this is where it gets tricky because you don't, it's easy to look at this right away and say, wow, that's a wide open aortic arch. You got a head and neck vessel coming right there. Everything must be fine, okay? But don't confuse the PDA with the aortic arch. Remember that the ductus in fetal life is an arch. It's a ductal arch. And so it should look like that as it does in the, in the uh, image on the left. Okay, this uh, also you can see a pulmonary artery, branch pulmonary artery coming off right here. So either we're talking about truncus or hemitruncus or this is the pulmonary artery and then the ductal arch. If you sweep over to the left a little bit, you see now ascending aorta, something smaller here, transverse arch that's hypoplastic. Okay, so that's what we're dealing with right now. This is the insertion of the ductus into the, the aortic arch. That's why you see the brachiocephalic artery, this left subclavian artery right there, because it's actually the same vessel as right here. Now, sweeping left to right here, the image on the left, you can see the difference between the ductus right there and the transverse arch. 
duck larch transverse arch sweeping. And then in this view on the right, we actually get both of them at about the same time, two color flow signals, pretty low velocity through that transverse arch. So we got to think about why that's the case. Okay, so there's our aortic arch. It sure looks small. It sure looks like in addition to the transverse arch being narrow, uh, there is a, a critical or a uh, severe coarctation. Um, so you have an exaggerated distance between those second and third brachiocephalics that we often do see with coarctation of the aorta. You have a juxtaductal posterior shelf right there. So this sure looks like coarctation with color. And this is just a still frame right here, though, kind of low velocity. So the question is why? And why do we have a normal Doppler signal across that area if we're saying that there is a severe coarctation? Well, the answer is that this is misleading because of the presence of the ductus. The large ductus will bypass that narrowing and you will have a normal pulsatility due to the flow across that ductus arteriosus. So you can't rely on Doppler signals in the presence of a large ductus, particularly in the neonate. Okay, so this still is severe coarctation. All right, just a few minutes now about how we treat coarctation. And I'm going to present some of the recent adult congenital heart disease guidelines from the AHA and the ACC. Um, I'd refer you to them. They're always changing, but these are the most recent ones from 2018. In addition to initial diagnosis of the coarctation, in order to, make, in order to plan the uh, surgical or transcatheter um, uh, approach, they do recommend advanced imaging with cardiac MR or CT. And furthermore, um, there is a, a weaker or less strong recommendation for intracranial aneurysm image or intracranial imaging to look for intracranial aneurysms. Typically, MRI is what we do. Uh, the, the argument against that by some is that we see these little aneurysms. Sometimes they're small and there often is nothing to do about it. So is it important that we document it? Our practice in general is to at least get one, one, head, uh, one advanced imaging uh, of the head. Uh, in late teenage years or adulthood. Now, why do we need to look at the uh, aortic arch a little closer with, uh, with uh, MRI or CT? It's because of this. In adults particularly, we want to see exactly where that coarctation is that, that feeds right into our planning for surgery or for catheter interventions. We want to understand the significance of collateral vessels, particularly if they're planning on going uh, to the OR uh, to predict bleeding or risk of bleeding. Um, and to make sure there aren't associated lesions, aneurysms, or anything else uh, in abnormal aorta in other ways, middle aortic syndrome, and so on and so forth. And it also provides a nice baseline to compare to after intervention because inevitably, whether they go to the cath lab or whether they go to the OR, they're going to get another study, uh, CT or MRI, and we'd want to have a good baseline to compare to. Here's another look at a CT angiogram. This is, a, I think, an older child, about 11 years old, uh, with a severe coarctation that measured about two millimeters. These large um, intercostal and vertebral arteries uh, that, that act as collaterals to the descending aorta. All right, if you have untreated coarctation, these are the guidelines for sports participation. Again, I would refer you to the original document here from 2015. The idea is that if you have an untreated coarctation that's mild, meaning the gradient is under 20, um, then you can, uh, you can participate in all except for the most rigorous sports there, okay? So um, that includes uh, these at the top that you would exclude, okay? So participating in these in the bottom is allowed, but that means that you, you have to tell them to stop bobsledding or windsurfing, I think, is on there too, which is an interesting one. I don't think I've ever had to tell anybody not to windsurf yet, but I know now for the next time, I guess, but being in Minnesota doesn't happen very often. Um, also, uh, if they have untreated coarctation, but they do have dilation of the aorta or aneurysm formation, even if it does not yet meet criteria for surgical repair, they further limit, or they recommend further limiting sports participation to these bottom two. So congratulations, your patient can play pool, it looks like, even, although they can't do basketball, which would be a tremendous disappointment. So I guess um, that is what it is. There are some people I know who go against the, the, these recommendation guidelines, but they're out there in publication, and so we have to kind of at least acknowledge that they're there. Now, for those who have had um, their coarctation treated, if everything is more or less normal, so the aorta is not enlarged, uh, they don't have any resting gradient, their blood pressure is well controlled and it doesn't increase with exercise, they can participate in all competitive sports, okay? So back to that whole grid. Uh, now, 
if uh, if they have a gradient that's above 20 or a hypertension or dilation of the aorta, then they are again are limited, although with albeit with a lower um, level of recommendation to that class 1A sports. That's that bottom left hand corner, the billiards and the bowling and stuff like that that nobody really does or really enjoys a whole lot. Billiards, bowling, cricket. There you go, cricket, curling, golf, or riflery. All right. Now back to the adult guidelines here. What do they recommend as far as treatment, surgical repair, or catheter-based stenting uh, for adults with hypertension and a significant coarctation? So not really any specific guidelines as far as um, what defines a significant coarctation, but if it needs to be treated, they would recommend it. There you go. Uh, just so you know, the guidelines in Europe actually favor stent implantation over surgical uh, intervention if the anatomy is suitable for that, and they spell that out specifically in the uh, European Society of Cardiology guidelines from, I think, 20, 2020, I believe. Um, uh, they also suggest that balloon angioplasty in situations where surgical or transcatheter or transcatheter stent implantation aren't feasible. I will say I can't think of a situation where we would have done angioplasty but, but not have done stent implantation. We would certainly favor stent over angioplasty. There's a much higher risk of aortic wall injury after balloon angioplasty alone. All right, so what constitutes an, uh, a significant coarctation? That's the ultimate question. So if you have a resting gradient of 20 millimeters or above 20 millimeters of mercury from upper to lower extremities, either by blood pressure or by Doppler, uh, in the setting of an anatomic coarctation, that is a significant narrowing, okay? Now, if you have a lower gradient, but you have decreased LV systolic function or aortic regurgitation or significant collateral flow, then that may be uh, also a significant coarctation that deserves attention. Other things that aren't really discussed a whole lot, uh, you know, what about the context of single ventricle? Uh, do we, should we have a lower threshold for intervening? My opinion is that we should, especially if it's a single right ventricle. You know, what constitute LV dysfunction? Is an EF of 50% LV dysfunction? Is an EF of 40%? Uh, and then what do we do when we don't have much of a resting gradient, but we can provoke a gradient by exercise? One would think that since we would limit people based upon exercise inducible gradient, uh, would limit their physical uh, or their sports participation, we should treat uh, in, along similar guidelines, but it hasn't been spelled out in those guidelines. Now, a little bit about what we've done historically with surgery, end-to-end -end anastomosis, where you just basically cut out the coarcted segment and, re and sew it back together. An extended end-to-end -end would bring this lower descending aorta to the undersurface of the transverse arch to help alleviate some transverse arch hypoplasia. Patch repair uh, is, a, is performed in some situations still. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then subclavian flap repair, much less frequently uh, performed these days. Uh, also, in adults, an ascending and descending bypass graft is a reasonable option for somebody who you think can get by with this one operation and be done with it. On occasion, the surgeons are really nice and they've shaped into a heart like that to make it really pretty. All right, this is just a trend over time at Mayo Clinic of the types of repairs done. Uh, the take home point from this is that since about 2000, we've done more, a, a, a proportionally larger number of interposition grafts or bypass grafts, likely due to a change in demographic in our population as well as the introduction or um, the increase in popularity in these bypass grafts, although they are, of course, not without uh, problems. One word about postoperative hypertension, it is an issue. This is a systematic review from a few years ago, 26 articles among that population, about a third of patients after treatment for coarctation still had significant hypertension. And in those articles, they did not identify difference in efficacy between ACE inhibitors, ARBs, or beta blockers. So it's kind of up to the provider to decide. All right, so what can we do in the cath lab? This is a 50, I think a 50, 52 year old uh, female who came to see me and in addition to having interesting uh, head and neck uh, branching pattern. She had a significant native coarctation of the aorta. So the image on the right is a 3D, 3D angiogram in the cath lab. We decided to put in a stent. This is a covered stent. Uh, we're taking a picture there with it partially inflated, showing that we've already occluded that coarctation. We then paste the right ventricle rapidly and deploy the stent very nicely in place there. Angiogram afterwards shows it wide open and a very gratifying result here shows that a gradient of 40 almost instantaneously becomes a gradient of about zero. Here's another case. A 30-year-old nurse with her first pregnancy, she was found to be hypertensive during pregnancy. She had a hypertensive urgency about a month after she delivered, treated with a number of medications. She was previously healthy. She had run two marathons. She was not large. 
but had persistent hypertension without a good explanation. On exam, her LV apex was somewhat displaced. She had a little bit of a, of a murmur. Carotids were okay, but pedal pulses and femoral pulses were abnormal. This was her chest x-ray, and if we look closely, what do we see? We see a three sign. We see rib notching. We're thinking um, coarctation of the aorta. This is the abdominal Doppler signal consistent with coarctation. No bicuspid valve. So remember, not everybody needs to have a bicuspid valve in order to have coarctation. And pretty normal LV size and function, which is good to see. Aortic arch views. OK, this is a little bit different. We saw an abnormal Doppler signal, but we see a kind of a normal aortic arch view. What, how do we make of that? Well, this is why. It's because she's had an acquired interruption. So it was a severe coarctation that eventually lost continuity there. And she's developed all these collaterals. And so you have a normal flow into this pouch. It does not go across the, the coarcted segment. And so you're not able to calculate a gradient across there, but still clearly a severe lesion that needs to be uh, treated. And it is with an ascending to descending bypass graft. All right, this is the abdominal signal before on the left and after on the right. Uh, the pulse wave uh, Doppler signal there before and after showing normalization of that Doppler signal. Another case, this is now a little kid, two month old who showed up a little bit small for his age with an interestingly described exam of a grade one slash three holosystolic murmur heard deeply over the pericardium. I think they might have been pushing too hard with the stethoscope. Uh, but femoral pulses were good, although the kid was a bit squirmy. Came for an echocardiogram. The murmur was consistent with this, which is a VSD with a lot of flow across it. Nailed it, we're done. Except if you look closer, you say, hmm, not a big VSD. A lot of flow going across it. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. This is the gradient across the VSD of about 90 millimeters of mercury. That would suggest really high LV pressure. And then you've got a lot of flow across the mitral valve. So there's a lot of flow across a pretty small VSD. What is pushing the flow across the VSD? It's LV hypertension. It's an, uh, due to a coarctation. You can see here abdominal uh, Doppler signal is abnormal. Aortic arch view there. You can see that posterior shelf right there. And despite his squirminess, you get a, a gradient of about 30 across the, uh, the uh, mean gradient of 30 or max instantaneous of 52 across that coarctation. Now, what do you, how do you treat it? Well, do you worry about the VSD or you worry about the coarct or both of them? We elected to treat the coarctation via thoracotomy, relieve the obstruction. And here you see before repair how much flow is going across the VSD. And just by relieving that afterload from the left ventricle, how much less flow there is. And he's done great and has not needed um, any further treatment uh, for this VSD. All right, last one, 30 seconds, a weird chest x-ray, 39-year-old female. She had a coarctation that was repaired at eight years of age. She went. She had been having annual cardiology follow-up. She went to visit a chiropractor, good for the chiropractor, who performed spine x-rays and saw this. And then after confirming that she did not, in fact, swallow a softball, you do a CT angiogram that shows this, which is a very large aneurysm, pseudoaneurysm in the region of her previous coarctation repair. This was a patient who had a Dacron graft patch repair of her coarctation, which is a, a significant risk factor for aneurysm formation, and that needed to be resected. So the take home point for that is even after repair, um, these, these people with coarctation need to be followed longitudinally over time for late um, sort of poor outcome, not poor outcomes, but late complications of the repair uh, and, and intermediate or some, some degree of non-echo imaging needs to be performed from time to time. Thank you very much. And it's been a pleasure to, to talk to you today.